for the subject I have today, I, I wanted to do a very practical sermon. I believe it's practical. The principles in it are certainly practical uh, in my life, and I, I would only assume that my life is not so different from yours. They wouldn't be practical for your practical for yours as well. I want to talk about being offended. You know, offenses are going to come, right? We're essentially promised that. Unless you're not a human being, if anyone here is not a human being, if you could raise your hand, we'd appreciate that. It'd be nice knowing who amongst us is not among the human race. I don't see any hands. That's good. Unless you are not a human being, it is a matter of time before you are offended about something. It can be an imaginary offense. It could be something where you really shouldn't be offended. Uh, it could be something where you have every right to be offended. In fact, it could be something where you're not even offended enough. It could be that it was something that you don't even realize how much that person dissed you or disliked you or, or was trying to communicate something uh, un, unjust and, and unappro inappropriate and terrible about you. Uh, but offenses are a part of life. In fact, we live in a time where being offended seems like it's everyone's favorite hobby. It seems like everyone is going to college to get their bachelor's degree in how to be offended and then seeking graduate level studies in the different specializations of offense. Everyone seems to want to be offended. And brothers and sisters, for us to think that doesn't rub off on us would be foolish. If there's anyone here who thinks that we are just walking unstained from the world and that nothing in the world touches us, nothing stains us, nothing corrupts us, it just bounces off us like bullets off of Superman. If that's what we think, we don't have our head on straight. That's not actually the picture of the Bible. The Bible warns about taking on the attitudes of the world. An offense is problematic to a body that seeks to be one, like Christ and the Father are one. You know, the Proverbs is a book filled with wisdom, and it mentions in Proverbs chapter 18, Proverbs chapter 18, and verse 19, Proverbs 18 and verse 19, we're warned here that a brother offended is harder to win than a strong city, and contentions are like the bars of a castle. When someone is truly offended at something you've done, or when you are offended at something someone else has done, it is a real blow to unity. It's a real blow to, a real burden, I would add, for brotherly love. It's a real difficulty. You know, and Mr. Robinson and I did a, a podcast for the youth yesterday. It's on the livingyouth.org website and on Spotify, Living Youth, uh, the Living Youth podcast. But we were talking about how why God says he hates divorce. And one of the things we talked about in that is how God, uh, whenever divorce is an option, in the society, then couples in that society don't necessarily press themselves to have to overcome all the hurdles that they normally would if they understood that they were in this for life. And when it comes to our spouses, offenses do come, but sometimes we press forward. We, we try to overcome those and, and still build a relationship because we're married. But what about our brothers and sisters in Christ? It's very easy because we don't live with them 24-7 uh, to do other things with that offense, not necessarily to overcome them like we should. And it is poisonous to the body of Christ. If we can't do the right things with offenses, especially since offenses are a given, that they absolutely will come, then this can't be a healthy body. We have to have tools. And the tools to deal with offenses are vital to us. You know, Batman has his utility belt, right? You know, he's got something for every cause. And when I think of Batman, I don't tend to think of the recent movies. I think of the really terrible 1960s uh, virtual sitcom. It was not a sitcom, it seemed like it. Uh, very corny, very odd, and Batman had everything on his utility belt. I remember one particular Batman movie there in the, I think it was late 60s, could have been very early 70s, 
pretty sure it was 60s. I wasn't alive when it came out. I saw it later. But I remember uh, Batman's being pulled up into a helicopter uh, played by Adam West, not the minister, Adam West, a different Adam West. And there's a shark. Uh, I don't know if it's on his leg or something. And sure enough, he pulls out his utility belt, uh, anti-bat shark spray or something. And he, and he sprays the shark and the shark goes away. A utility belt would be great. The one that has a solution to everything. Well, the fact is God does give us utilities. He does give us tools to handle offense. When offense is gnawing away at us, when something has come between us and a brother because we have been offended, God does give us tools to bring to bear. And that's what I'd like to talk about for today's sermon is to go through a list of those. Uh, it may not be a comprehensive list. You may actually be able to think of some others, but these clearly are useful. They do help. They do work. And so I'd like to talk about uh, different tools we can bring to bear from our personal utility belt uh, to deal with offense when we are offended. Because if you've never been offended, it's only a matter of time. And the title of my sermon today is, I'm Offended. And the way you write down that is with an exclamation mark. So I'm offended, exclamation mark. And my apologies to the sound people if this is really terrible. Not so much, I won't do it one more time. I'm offended. Well, okay, fine, you're offended. Then what do you do about that? Today, we're gonna to talk about it in the sermon. Before that, we need to first set the stage. When offense occurs, what does God care about? What does he want out of this? I'd like to highlight one important thing. Turn to Matthew chapter 18. It is worthwhile also to talk about how not to be offensive. Uh, that's uh, something I think a lot of us could use some work on. I know I've certainly had to work on not being unnecessarily offensive and certainly still have work to do. But I'd like to talk about this inevitable thing because that's not something you can always control in the same way. You might control whether you're being offensive or not. You can tone that down, but still, when you're the recipient of that, what can we do? It is important to address, and God has a certain goal in mind when offense takes place. It doesn't mean it's always possible. You know, God doesn't want anyone to perish, for instance, and yet we know some will choose to perish. It doesn't mean it's possible, but it does still reflect his mind and what he cares about. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15, we read here Christ telling us, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. Now, we will talk about the rest of Matthew 18 later in the sermon. We're not going to go there first, and there's a reason that I don't want to go there first. I'd like to highlight some different tools. But notice what God wants if he hears you, you've gained your brother. God doesn't like one part of the body with such friction against the other part of the body. You know, when you have one part of the body that doesn't really want to deal with the rest of the body, we often think of that as cancerous. It's a part of the body that doesn't want to be a part of the body where it's attached to. It's unhealthy for the rest of the body where it is. It's causing damage. It's doing harm. God doesn't want those parts of the body that, that don't agree with each other. They can't be with each other. And God wants us to gain our brother. It's important to him. In fact, how important is it? Uh, if we turn a few chapters earlier in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, and here a statement on the sermon, uh, during the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5 and verse, so start in verse 23. Jesus Christ tells his audience in Matthew 5, 23, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. He's not saying don't offer your gift. I mean, do the thing that you should. And yet at the same time, recognize if your brother has something against you, that has great potential to impact your relationship with God. The God who loves you and the God who loves your brother. 
You know, if you're a parent, how difficult a burden is it on you when your children don't get along? It's difficult, right? It's a burden. It takes up part of your uh, precious time that you need to do all the other things you need to do. It's you invest in not just trying to make them survive each other, but somehow be reconciled. You're counting on them having that brotherly bond later in life. Because you're not always going to be there and you want them to think of their siblings as people they can go to, people they can count on. God cares about that. If you remember your brother has something against you, and I, one thing that I have personally been corrected by in the terms of this passage is it doesn't necessarily even say if, it's, if you know, for instance, that it's your fault. That is, can you, have you made some kind of effort to truly lay things aside. Again, it, there's no promises it's going to work. You can go try to reconcile with your brother and your brother spit in your face, cast you aside, smack your gift out of your hand. There's no guarantees, but have we tried? Can we go before God honestly and say, God, as I give you this gift, I can say in my heart, I have sought to reconcile with my brother. I did reach out on Facebook. Uh, I did actually give him a call. Uh, I did send her a card. Have we tried? God isn't going to fault us for things we truly have no control over, but he will for not being willing to stretch and do the things that he asks of us. It matters to God. God doesn't want his body in disarray. He doesn't want people forcing themselves to sit in the same room while their heart is repelled by the presence of another person and would find itself, would rather find itself someplace else. God wants us to be able to reconcile with our brothers if at all possible. So keep in mind as we go through this list that reconciliation is God's goal. Not necessarily punishment, not necessarily uh, justification in the eyes of other people, God's goal is reconciliation, reconciliation with each other if possible, but even reconciliation with him in terms of whatever uh, spiritual stumbling blocks this offense may have caused. And we'll discuss those just a bit, a little bit later. Also, before we get into what you can do, let's talk about what not to do, because there are tools we reach, to, we reach for really, really quickly. We're offended and we go here or we go there. Let's make sure we rule those out real quickly. Let's talk about some things we should not do when we're offended. One, we should not gossip and bear tales. We should not gossip and bear tales. Now, when I say gossip and bear tales, and, and this can be a topic on its own, I don't want to take a lot of time to elaborate, but let me say, I'm not just talking about false tales. You know, sometimes people will pass along a tale and they'll feel justified because they know it's true, because they were there, because they experienced it and saw it. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not gossiping. This actually happened to me. Well, actually, let's turn to Revelation chapter 12. And sometimes just by saying that, some people can decide quickly, oh, I think I know where you're going. It's only so many things in Revelation chapter 12 well, again, if we know, then God knows to hold us accountable for what we know. In Revelation chapter 12, we read a vital, important description of Satan the devil. And it says here of Satan the devil in Revelation chapter 12, we'll start in verse 9. It says, so the great dragon was cast out, verse 9 of Revelation 12, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, the opponent, the adversary, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven. Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Now let me ask you, if the devil is, which we know he is because this verse describes him as doing so, and the devil is accusing each of us before God, let me ask you, is he just making stuff up? Is any single person in the room or by, certainly behind the lectern, is any single person's attitude so pure 
Are our emails so righteously angelic? Uh, are our conversations so pure that the devil has no material that we've happened to have given him? Honestly, if I were the devil, and by the way, I don't think I am. I'll check my driver's license later. But if I were, that's actually the stuff I would bring up before God. Is, did, you, did you see the way he said he talked to his wife a while ago this morning during breakfast? God, I'm sorry. I thought your people understood that marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. Are you telling me that's how Christ, you know, plans on talking to the bride? Did you see the attitude that person gave his boss or coworker in that email? God, is this actually what you want to have in your kingdom for all time? Because it seems like it's every other email. I see it in this, your child's emails. Let me just say personally, this isn't a big true confessions hour, but I have noticed that over the course of my life, I give the devil more than enough real life accurate material. And let me say, I know some of you well enough to know that you do too. <laughs> We're not perfect the devil doesn't have to go to God accusing us based on trumped up, made up charges. But that said, and here's why I want to make that point about bearing tales. While God is hearing the devil make these accusations against the people that Christ died for, do we want God looking over the devil's shoulder and seeing you doing exactly the same thing? Do I want God looking over the devil's shoulder and seeing me doing exactly the same thing? I don't. I'm chastised by the fact that I know, certainly, uh, I've made my mistakes in the past. I, I'm sure I have. But we don't want that, brethren. That's not one thing that we can do when we're offended, is just go and decide to spread because it really happened. Well, it really happened. That doesn't give us license uh, to take it someplace else. And then one more thing that I'll mention we don't want to do, we want to be on guard against, and that is growing bitter. If you turn to Hebrews and chapter 12, Hebrews and chapter 12. Thank you for ever put the bottle of water up here. I can't speak for other ministers. I know as a minister, I get, I feel a little challenged to look dignified drinking from a plastic bottle of water behind the lectern, but I'll do my best. There was a whole discussion at one of the feast sites about that. It was, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> but I am grateful. Thank you. In Hebrews chapter 12, we'll start in verse 14. Paul appeals to all of us in verse 14 of Hebrews 12. Pursue peace with all people. Brethren, your brother and sister in Christ is a part of all people. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. He emphasizes for cause, looking carefully. Bitterness, bitterness sinks its roots so subtly and so quickly, and it grows so fast. It's something that takes careful examination, asking, am I growing bitter about this? Is this something that is actually affecting me far more than I give it credit for? If so, it might mean I am falling short of grace a bit. Those who truly understand themselves as recipients of grace increasingly cannot help but extend it to others. How can you not? When someone sees themselves, for instance, as, an, as a, a full source, uh, sorry, full recipient of generosity, you surely know yourself from your own experience that inspires within you the desire to be generous. Same with grace. When you understand yourself as an imperfect person who does not deserve the grace that God has extended through Jesus Christ, then all the more, and it, it does happen more as you mature, it does grow, you can't help but want to be more gracious. 
as part of the fruit of the Spirit working in you and growing. And so looking carefully for this, when you are offended, that moment when an offense has come to you, whether it's offense from a friend, from a family member, whether it's offense from a minister, uh, friends from a, a letter from the church, uh, offended by a parent, offended by a child, whenever offense comes to you, that is a moment when bitterness is right there ready to just start digging into the soil of your life and growing into something terrible. And we're warned to look carefully for that. Look carefully for that. And then finally, I won't take too much time with this one and uh, we won't turn to another verse for it, though there are verses. And that is acting with malice. Another way not to respond to offense is to act with malice. What does that mean? You know, how do we understand malice? You know, sometimes when you receive a nasty email, what's the biggest impulse is to write a nasty one back. Sometimes when someone has peppered their comments to you with something meant to put you down, to show some lack of respect, or to put you in your place as they see it, how tempting is it to want to do the same? Malice is that evil instinct to want to strike back when we've been stricken. We've been hurt and we want to hurt back. Malice. It's, it's, uh, we talk about often during the days of unleavened bread uh, because we're not to seek the leaven of malice and wickedness. That desire to hurt back grows in your life. But it's, it's, it's part of the animal world, right? The, the, it's the animal that seeks to bare its teeth and strike back when it feels attacked and threatened. God is expecting us to grow more. Uh, you know if, if you're married, I can't, fa let's say this, if anyone has been married for any length of time, I've been married for, for 30 years, if you've been married for a good length of time and your spouse has never hurt your feelings and you've never felt even the prick, even the slightest temptation to somehow say something a little sharp back, maybe you dial it down to half as sharp because you're the nice one, you know? Uh, but if you've never been tempted, then I, I need to know what are you eating? What are you drinking? What do you, you know, what, what, is, what is it in you that is, is, is causing, giving you something uh, to be able to resist such things? Now, hopefully God's spirit is in you and you have found over time in your marriage, you are resisting those things. But malice comes very naturally to us. And malice is a way God forbids when it comes to responding to offense. We're not to respond maliciously. All right, so those things out of the way. Let's spend the rest of the time talking about what tools we do have. It's like, all right, fine. I've been offended. What do I do, right? I've got, it's in my lap. It's right here. It's an offense. I'm staring at it. You've told me I can't just, you know, pet it and nurse it, you know, and try to make it angrier. Uh, you've told me I've got to do something with it. Well, then what do I do with it? All right, here's the first action you can seek to take. The first tool you can wield against offense. It's going to sound brilliant when you hear it. Why are you laughing? You shouldn't take that for granted. It could sound brilliant. It, it won't. The first thing you can try, and believe it or not, as ridiculous as it sounds, it does work sometimes. And that is, you can just not be offended. You can just not be offended. You know, a lot of the time I spend on Twitter, it's the one social media I, I dabble in probably more than others. It's amazing how many people I see offended that don't have to be offended. They could have just not tweeted that day. Uh, they didn't have to go online uh, and, and respond to something and, and get uh, outraged about something. You can actually simply not be offended. It sounds ridiculous, but it's one of the most overlooked options. If we'll turn to Psalm 119, and I don't mean reading this Psalm to be a bit of sleight of hand, and I'll explain that but I do think that it applies. Turn to Psalm 119. And I'll read it in the New King James Version. Psalm 119 and verse 165. Psalm 119 and verse 165. It says here in the New King James, great peace have those who love your law and nothing causes them to stumble. You know, nothing is a stumbling block for them. Well, I would ask your indulgence and I'll explain the connection because it, it can be overdone. 
uh, in the old King James Version, Psalm 119, verse 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Well, it's not just talking about offense in the sense that I am here, and I want to make sure I'm, I'm transparent about that. You know, stumbling is also a matter of sinning, right? It's talking about, you know, those who love God's law, things that cause other people to sin won't cause them to sin. They'll have the ability to step over those things or, or walk around those things. And the causing of stumbling blocks or offenses in this sense, it is important. You know, it's something I, I, I've mentioned before in uh, uh, this atonement sermon about the two goats. Uh, they're recognizing that we have the one goat that represents Jesus Christ who died for our sins, but the other goat on the day of atonement represents the devil. And hands are placed on the head of that goat representing the devil and his part to play in our sins, which we freely chose, is still recognized. That's one thing that, you know, some worldly women uh, like to say to justify their attire. You know, they'll wear skimpy outfits or outfits that are too tight. And they'll say, look, hey, if some guy, some guy gets filled with lust and all the rest, that's on him. Well, it actually is on him. You're right. It is. Uh, his free will choices he will be held accountable for. And hopefully he has Christ's blood to cover him. But the fact that we were so blasé about putting a stumbling block in front of our brother is on us. Otherwise, why would our sins have any role to play on the head of the goat representing Satan, the devil? So uh, there's important lessons here. It is talking about stumbling and sinning. But that said, that's part of why I'm motivated to cover a topic like this. Because when you are offended, it is still like a stumbling block. It's like something has been thrown at your feet to trip you up, and there is great opportunity for sin. I say opportunity, not one you should take, right? Uh, but the, the odds of you sinning when an offense is thrown at your feet become higher than they were just a little while before. And God is looking for people for whom nothing causes them to stumble. They're capable of just stepping over that. We do have the ability, especially if Jesus Christ is living in us, when presented with something that would offend most other humans on the planet, to simply be not offended and just move on. Just move on. Uh, I would recommend a sermon uh, that we have in our library by Dr. Jeffrey Fall titled, Be Not Easily Offended. Uh, you can search for it at the uh, LCG, members.lcg.org website. Just search for Dr. Jeffrey Fall. Or if you know how to search with uh, Google, just, just Google through our sermons for the word offended. I think it's the only sermon we have with the word offended in the title. And Dr. Fall covered, in fact, he was here when he covered that. Be not easily offended. So that's the first option. Just choose not to be offended. Just exercise your mind and decide, ah, you know, I'm not going to be offended. Great. All right. Good. That's it. I hope you all have a good rest of your Sabbath, and I'm going, no, that's actually more to it than that. Uh, it'd be nice if it were just that, but let's say you can't make that choice. Let's say the fellow who just, you know, punched you in the nose or uh, is still saying terrible things about your mother or whatever it is that is offending you, you recognize, all right, this, this is offensive. I, I, can't, I can't just uh, think it away. I, I am offended. This has offended me. Well, then let's talk about a second tool that we can apply. And that is the tool of simply overlooking it. Just overlook it. Just move on and forget about it. In fact, let me ask you real quickly, what kind of world would we live in if every single person refused to overlook every single thing that ever offended them? Increasingly, it doesn't take much imagination. Because increasingly, that's the world we live in. Just overlook it. Uh, let's look at some scriptures. Uh, Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 10. And that ability to overlook things is commended by God. And it's necessary to be a functioning body of Christ. 
in he, uh, sorry, Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12. We're encouraged there. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Love covers all sins. It is not a coincidence, I do not believe, that some of the hardest to offend people I know happen also to be some of the most loving people I know. When we have sought to develop in our hearts, in our minds, the love of Jesus Christ for all people, it becomes easier to overlook their faults and easy to overlook offenses, whether real or imagined. In fact, overlooking them gives us time to discover that maybe it's actually imaginary. It is amazing how some of those offensive emails turn out not to be intended to be offensive at all. The person just doesn't know how to write decent emails. They don't recognize that when they've dropped 85% of the nonverbal communication they can apply, they sound terrible. And then you talk to them in person and they get that other 85% back and actually they seem like a decent person again. Sometimes they validate. No, that actually was offensive. It was meant to be offensive and I'm glad you're offended. But sometimes it's not. I mean, think about our own lives. I would ask you again, let's examine ourselves. Uh, I know I can speak for me that I'm, I'm certain that I'm not so aware of myself that every time I've slipped and fallen and sinned before God, I've immediately dropped to my knees. Otherwise, people would have to pass me in the halls at headquarters. Oh, Smith's on his knees again in the halls. I wonder what he did, what, what he did this time, right? That would be difficult. We, we're not that aware of ourselves. And what, yet if, what if God refused to deal with us until somehow we figured it out every single time. God in his mercy does not show every person who's just been baptized a list of all the terrible things about their character, personality, uh, and everything they're doing wrong. That would crush a person. Who would want to do that? God is kind enough to show us some things later in life. And then we're humbled to realize we've been that way for a long time. God is capable of overlooking those things and just continuing to love us and to work with us. Can we do that too? It's going to be all the more important in the end times. If you turn to 1 Peter in chapter 4, I'm very grateful for Mr. Jonathan McNair's sermon recently where he talked very plainly about the times to come. It wasn't just in terms of prophetic details. It wasn't just terms of things that we do need to know biblically. But in terms of real life impact in our lives, what are we going to do as services begin failing? What are we going to do as the civilization we count on to exist day by day in a practical sense begins to deteriorate? I really appreciate that sermon. As those times come, people tend to draw closer together of necessity, right? We will draw closer together of necessity especially in the place of safety. I, I've often said, well, who, who, who in this room would you not want to be bunking with in the place of safety? Wouldn't be surprised if that's who it's going to be, right? God wants us working on these things, right? We're not going to stop learning before, uh, when we go to the place of safety. But that said, as times get difficult and as the world begins to press us, we will draw closer together. But you know, the closer you get with someone, the odds increase that offense will be caused, that's so why some people stay distant, right? They, don't, they fear that they might cause offense. And let's be upfront, the closer you get with someone, the odds of offending increase. And as the end times come, we've got to be able to handle those kinds of offenses. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. Peter writes here in verse 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. These aren't just ideals. It's important for us to think of ourselves in the scenarios depicted by such verses in the circumstances where they're the hardest to fulfill. Like verse nine, it says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. It's easy to think, oh yeah, I wanna be hospitable. I wanna be a hospitable person. And you know, we invite the people that we're closest to, to our house, or you know, we're here at services and we talk to the people that are easy to talk to. But if that were the case, why would he bother to add without grumbling? 
right? You know, I talk to Mr. De Simone frequently. I rarely feel motivated to grumble. Maybe sometimes, <laughs> but rarely, right? Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're close, we're friends. On the other hand, Mr. I'm just kidding. I'm not gonna name somebody else the opposite. Uh, but still, there are people in our lives, family members, brother, brothers and sisters in Christ. Why is he saying this? Because real godly hospitality is when you can have that hospitality and show that hospitality even in situations where deep down you want to grumble. You know, you don't get the same kind of credit before God with the most politeful and respectful email you've ever written until it's to someone that you have trouble being polite to and respectful to. And that's part of what he's talking about here. When he says love will cover a multitude of sins, it's, it's talking about having this fervent love for one another. Why? Because your brother will sin against you. Sometimes it's just perceived and it's an illusion, but sometimes it's not. The scary part is it's, all, it's not always easy to tell the difference. When those times come, do we have the ability to just overlook it? I don't want to emphasize some scriptures that I emphasize pretty heavily, I think, in my most, my most recent sermon before this. But if you reflect back to Christ's teaching about the extra mile in Matthew chapter 5, are we willing to go the extra mile with someone? If someone has offended us, Matthew 5, 41 talks about when a person obligates you to go one mile with them, can you and I go too? And that's what we're talking about here. So yes, let's just embrace it. Let's say, okay, I, I tried to just, just not be offended. I couldn't. So I had to get my second tool out and I want to overlook it. This person's offense is, is pressing me to go a mile with them. Okay, I'm, I'm going to do my best to go two miles. And I'm going to keep interacting with this person and try to just move it out of my mind and just overlook it. You know why? Because none of us are perfect. I, I know one thing that has helped me, and I, I wish I could stand up here and say that I'm perfect at all these things, and I'm certainly not, but I, I like to think God has helped me grow in some ways. I do know one thing that's been helpful that I'll, I'll share is I've tried to turn the tables and imagine myself, what kind of life would I live if everyone in my life never exercised overlooking the offenses that I have placed in front of them? And I don't believe in a multiverse, but if there were a multiverse where there's a Wally Smith who's having to live with the offenses he's caused everyone and no one overlooks those offenses, I don't want to be that Wally Smith. That would be a rough life, just like your life would be rougher if every offense you happen to generate, purposefully or accidentally, was never overlooked by anyone. Surely we can do the same. So just try to overlook it, right? Just try to overlook it. All right, let's say you've tried to overlook it. And it ain't happening, right? Uh, part of a good robust tool belt means you've got more than one tool, more than two tools. So you've tried to not be offended. That really didn't work. So now you've just tried to overlook it. And that didn't really work. This is going to seem like it's the same. And I do not think that it is, which is why I've made it a separate tool. A third tool I'd recommend is simple forgiveness. Simple forgiveness. In my mind, and again, I'm tailoring this based on my personal experience, I know when I'm overlooking an offense that I feel has been laid at my feet versus when I'm actively seeking to forgive an offense that's been laid at my feet. Those don't feel the same. To you, they might. And so if this, is, this is clearly not the only way to organize these tools. But for me, it feels very different. God has given us the tool of forgiveness where we understand something, we don't even have to assume the best. You ever been cut off and try to assume the best of that person on the highway? I've been cut off by guys and thought, well, you know, he's probably got a pregnant wife in the back seat, and he's trying to get her to the hospital, and he's all, you know, feeling nervous, and, and he probably didn't even notice me there. And I know that's probably kind of a fiction, but it's a fun story to just rattle off in my head to recognize I don't know what's going on in everyone's life. He could be a bank robber as far as I know. I have no idea. Maybe he's on his way to my house to set it on fire. I don't know. But, you know, sometimes those things help, but that helps me overlook things, puts it in a perspective, and I just move on. But sometimes that doesn't work, and I have to move to active forgiveness, and it's a tool God has given us, and we have the perfect model. If we turn to Luke chapter 23, you know, part of the beauty of the Father 
and Christ's plan for us is the fact that it wasn't just a matter of giving us a way of life. It was a matter of one of them condescending to come to this world and live it in the most difficult of circumstances for us so we can see it. And so we have an eternal example to reflect on forever. And here we have in Luke chapter 23, reading of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It says in verse 34, Luke 23 and verse 34, we read here, as Jesus was there, hammered and nailed to a piece of wood like an insect, it says, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. They thought so little of his suffering that even in front of his own face, they could gamble for his belongings like a game. And his instinct was to reach out with forgiveness that they not have what they were doing held against them. There is power in that, brethren. It, it seems the opposite. The world depicts it as the opposite. I've seen, a, I think it was a quote from Gloria Steinem. I don't want to slander her, but I do know it was someone early in the, uh, uh, in the women's liberation movement who was saying power can never be given. It can only be seized. You have to seize power from others. That's not the way God deals with power. You can accept power from God in that choice to just forgive somebody, not require penance of them, not require them to jump through some sort of hoops. Will these people who nailed Jesus Christ to this rough wood to torture him to death one day repent? I hope so. That would be wonderful if they come up in the resurrection and realize, you're that guy? I can't believe I did that. That would be fantastic. And yet, of all the pain he was experiencing at this time, this was the choice he made to make sure those people were forgiven. Now, it's easy. When I say it's easy, I'm just confessing that I also am human and have been there. It's easy to read that and think, okay, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Oh, but this guy knew what he did, right? This guy who did that, this lady who did that, when I brought this to the covered dish meal and that person said what that person said about what I brought to the covered dish meal, she used the exact words she knew would make me feel this way. Uh, yes, that does happen. There are people who offend you and they know it. Frankly, there are people who enjoy it. If some of us are honest with ourselves, there's times we're the person who has enjoyed singing the other person. But backing up, let me say that is not an excuse. Christ loved us before we loved him, while we were yet sinners. He didn't feel this way after they apologized. And if this really is a stumbling block in terms of choosing to forgive, then again, I won't go into detail. I talked about it in detail detail last time, but then go to the example of Stephen and him being martyred and him having his opportunity to live out Luke 23. And as Stephen was being stoned to death by people who knew what they were doing, they were angry that he had accused them of sinning before God and were striving to shut him up because everything he said was true. And he still prayed to God before he died and asked God not to hold their choices against them. We should be a forgiving people. That should be a part of our default options is just simply forgiving someone and not holding their crimes against them. You know, if you go to Matthew 18, we have that famous count, right? Matthew 18. And I, I don't want to slander Peter. He may not have been bragging when he said this. It always feels like he, he was, but... He'll be in the resurrection. I pray that I'm there to, uh, to be able to meet him and talk with him about this. And he can say, oh, you did me wrong, Smith. I wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't that kind of guy. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 21. In Matthew 18 and verse 21, it says, Peter comes up to Jesus Christ and says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? <laughs> you know, mother, mother, pin a rose on me. Look at me, you know. And I actually might think, it's easy to think seven times isn't a big deal. At the same time, I have known people that one great offense was all it took and they never spoke again. 
never spoke again. I actually have blood relatives in my past. I remember going to funerals and knowing that so-and-so would not talk to so-and-so and not to expect it because they had gone for years not speaking to each other and never would. So he, he might have had cause to think, oh, I'm going to really stretch. He's going to love this. Plus seven. We all like sevens, right? So he goes up up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Forgiving should be such a default for you that that's essentially, it's not, it doesn't mean you go home, by the way, and make a big chart. All right, well, here's 490 squares. This was number one, mister. You know, I, was, I can't say this. But I was about to say, it'd be really creepy, wouldn't it, to go visit someone, you know, new. And they, oh, I want you to bring, I want to bring into my forgiveness room. Oh, that's really nice. And the wall's plastered with posters with names and 490 blocks on each one. And they're checked off in various states. You know, you just back slowly out of a room like that. You know, you want to talk with a person like that outside the house because uh, you don't know what's coming. But Christ didn't say this as an actual limit. Wouldn't that be the worst accounting job ever? Hey, you need to keep track of this brother's sins so you know when you can stop forgiving them. He said that as something that who would even want to count 490 times? All the sevens in that mix is sort of a picture of completeness and perfection. You need to be willing to go the whole way. Because God the Father and Jesus Christ are willing to go the whole way with us in forgiveness. They don't hold back. Do we want Christ looking at us, holding back on forgiving our brother? When that is someone the very next morning, when that man or, or woman, a sister, goes to pray by their bed, God plans on listening to those prayers. God still loves and deals with that person. How does it feel to him to look at us and then to see a different sort of spirit? And I understand it's, it's a big thing to say, hey, stop falling short of God's standard of what he is. And I'm not saying it's easy either. It's certainly not easy for me, but it doesn't change the fact this is the standard that's impressed upon all of us. So that is an option. Forgiveness, just forgive the person and move on. At the same time, sometimes that's too difficult. Not because we necessarily fall short, but because it's something that feels like it needs more. Maybe we need help forgiving. Uh, or maybe it's the kind of thing that, that just, they're really should be something more. Maybe there's a restitution we feel should be necessary, some sort of accounting, or we're just struggling with it. What is another tool we have in our utility belt to deal with offense? That is counseling with the ministry. Seek counsel with the ministry. We are blessed with riches in the church of God. It's easy sometimes to think, oh, we do wish we had more pastors in the field. We wish we had more men in the field. As Mr. Ames would be quick to encourage all of us, are you actually praying that God would send laborers out into the field and into the harvest? He's very good about that. One of the things I love about Mr. Ames is how he holds us all accountable for doing the things the Bible says to do. Are we praying that God would send more laborers into the field? But that said, we also don't have nearly as much excuse as say our brothers and sisters in the first century or many other centuries of the past, because even when I don't have a minister really close, we've got phones, we've got text, we've got emails, we've got cars. It is amazing the access we have to resources. Counsel with the ministry, that's what they're there for, is to serve and to help and to guide us into finding ways to overcome uh, the obstacle of offense when maybe we're having a hard time ourselves. Uh, turn to Philippians and chapter 4. Philippians and chapter 4. Now, how did this come to Paul's attention? I don't know. Did someone seek counsel of him to, uh, to, to work with it? A situation? Possibly. Maybe the individuals themselves here did. But someone went to the minister for him to know. I can guarantee Paul didn't see the friction on a Zoom call of any sort. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 2, 
Paul writes, I implore Eodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Here he is engaging his helpers there. Help these people work together. Help these people be able to be of the same mind when they are so disparate right now, when they're so split especially in America, we are trained to be these rugged individualists who don't go for help. It's amazing. I remember Mr. Burson making this point, uh, Mr. Uh, David Burson. And, you know, eventually you're in the ministry and you see it yourself. And I remember him looking at the crowd saying, hey, all you guys out there that don't want to go to the minister to counsel about your failing marriages. If you ever know David Burson, you know, that would be right exactly what he would say. You know, do it. Stop, stop pretending being a man means not going and getting help from the minister. I know you're afraid people, you know, will find out your marriage is failing. He says, don't worry. We all already know. We can all see it. You know, just go, just go and get help. And he was saying that often because as a man, it's hard to go get help sometimes. You feel like, well, I'm failing, right? You know, uh, who wants to go to another man and admit that we're not pulling something off, right? There's a reason even in the gym, guys, that we got spotters. We should. You know me, I'm, I'm in the gym all the time. You know, anyway, you know, there's a reason we have spotters, Right? is because God has given us, well, not, not in the gym. We have spotters because we need help sometimes. God has given us a body because we need help sometimes. And he's given us a ministry that he has essentially said, look, I'm gonna work through this person. Yes, I know this minister is imperfect. Uh, I know that just like you are, right? And yet I ensured hands were laid on him. I ensured that he was ordained and I have made him your shepherd. Let me work through him. To help you. It's like God, you know, the old joke where someone wanted to be saved from a flood and people come by and he's praying and they throw him all these things. They say, oh, here's a, here's a life uh, raft. Jump in. Oh, here's a, a life preserver. Grab it. And he did. oh no, I'm waiting for God to save me. And God says, what do you, you know, after he drowns, why well, I sent you the life raft. I sent you the thing. Why did you do anything? You want God to help? Talk to your minister. God says, well, I, I understand you're, you're praying to me for advice. That's wonderful. You know, I gave you a pastor, right? I gave you a shepherd. In fact, the Greek word for pastor is the same word as shepherd. As shepherd. We need to allow ourselves to be shepherded sometimes. You know, it's very tempting to go to that person that you know whenever you're offended, which is what we're talking about. It's easy to go to that person you know will sympathize that person that will even chime in, you know, I know that's what so-and-so does all the time. You know, in fact, here's what so-and-so did to me one time, right? That's the kind of conversation we want. Not really. It's what our carnal self wants. Part of being a pastor is going to God and asking for that kind of impartiality to be able to truly serve someone with impartiality. And so if these other steps aren't working, and if we can go to the pastor with a sincere mind that is truly looking for help, it's kind of like sometimes, uh, <laughs> okay, it never happened quite like this, but we did rear four children. And so certain practices can, you know, there's certain realities you see in children that you reflect do, do actually uh, uh, represent humanity in general. There's only one who's here today, the rest are at camp. So I rest assure you it's the other three who would sometimes exhibit these, these difficulties, not the one who's feeding me currently. Um, you know, they, when the child comes, you know, it isn't really always, Father, Father, please. I had boys. They said, Father, Father, please help me live in peace with my brother. I desire to be a true brother to him and him to me. If I am wrong, I pray thee, Father, to correct me. Um, but if it be him, help me to be sincere and humble and to uh, give him room to change. That's honestly like, not dad, so-and-so did this. Ah, you know, and they're, they're bleeding or whatever the case is. Wow, what, what happened? And then you go talk to the other person and it's like, well, yeah, but I did this because he set fire to all my toys or whatever it is. They don't always tell the other part of the story, right? 
Um, I do remember, I will say once that I'll actually say this was the one who's here. I'll give him some credit for this. Uh, one of the boys came to me. I won't say which one. But regardless, he said, Dad, you know, so-and-so's doing this. You know, he's, 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 he's just really frustrated. He's, so-and-so was, in this case, the one who's here. And I will, I'll, I'll say his name. It's rhymes with Schmenjamin, right? So he, he says, you know, Schmenjamin's doing this and doing that. And I said, okay, it was going to be another story, I'm sure. So I went to Schmenjamin and said, hey, so-and-so says this is going on. What's going on? He says, well, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. He just completely confessed, which doesn't always happen. So, so credit, you know, credit where it's due there. But if you're going to your actual physical father and you really want to solve things like Christ is talking about when it comes to reconciling, it's not just to get the other person in trouble. It's going to seek help. Not please fix my brother. Maybe that's going to be the outcome, but please help me. Because I, I want to encourage us to think of the offense as a burden we have to deal with. Sometimes it's not something maybe we can do many of these things with, but there are tools we can bring to bear, which is why we're talking about this. So consider the ministry as an option. Consider yourself a sheep who wants to be shepherded. And if these other things aren't working, we find we can't even consider talking to the ministry and counseling. Okay. Finally, let's go to Matthew 18. Uh, Matthew 18. And the principle here is to go to your brother. And sometimes that'll be the advice of the ministry is to go to your brother. If you're a child, you, you might know how unsatisfying it is when you go to your mom and dad and you just want to get somebody in trouble and they say, well, you need to go talk to your brother and do this. Like, ugh, this is not what I wanted. I wanted, you know, lightning to come from the sky, you know, and you're not bringing the rain and the thunder, dad. You're, you're being way too reasonable and handsome. Uh, let's see. Go to your brother. But when you go to her brother, remember the goal. So in Matthew chapter 18... It's very easy, and Matthew 18 is a process. Let me say that. It is a process. It does show how that things can escalate. But I do want to give us another thought related to Matthew 18. Matthew 18, and we'll start again in verse 15. And just read this passage. Matthew 18 and verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, You've gained your brother. But if he, again, notice that's the goal, gaining your brother. Not necessarily being declared just in the sight of all in the world, but gaining your brother. Healing a breach. Also notice it says, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. You and him alone. It's not an opportunity to dirty someone's reputation. It's not a time to gang up on someone. In fact, you might discover when you discuss it with them that you're at fault. It's great not having an audience if that happens to be the outcome. But it does escalate in verse 16. If he will not hear, take, one, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Now, in this case, it doesn't just mean go get your buddies. This is a, a wonderful time to get those who are impartial in the congregation. If you've counseled with a minister, this is a time perhaps to, to talk with that minister. Uh, who would be, you know, someone worthwhile? Maybe it's a local deacon. Uh, maybe it's someone, it's so, it, it should be someone impartial who can actually help judge in a circumstance uh, and not just simply your buddies that are going to help and gang up. It says, if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And let's say that still doesn't work. Well, I'll talk about what can happen between the lines, but let's just finish the passage. In verse 17, it says, and if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. Now, by the way, the church here does not mean the people of the church. It's so easy to conclude that, but the context makes it absolutely plain that is not what he's talking about. There are those who like to do that. Uh, thankfully, I don't know of any of them in the living church of God, but I have seen it where people decide to go online or something and publish to the entire church in terms of the individuals of the entire church. Here's what this person has done and here's how they've wronged me. No, the context makes it plain that he's not talking about it. Let's jump to the next part, verse 18. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He is not talking about the power we all have individually. I'm sorry, 
you and I don't have the power as individual Christians to bind and loose things on earth or in heaven, or God hasn't granted us authority to be the ones by which he communicates those things that he has bound in heaven. Verse 19, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it'll be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. Well, let me ask, because people often think of this as, oh, so that means anytime two of us are together, Christ is there too. Let me ask you a real quick question. If you're by yourself, lost and afraid, is Christ with you? Yes. He's not talking about that. He's not talking about just if any two people are together. Oh, he's not saying, oh, I'm so sorry you're lost and you had a car accident. If only there was one more person with you, I could be gathered with you, you know. Uh, in my name, instead, you're on your own, buddy. I hope you make it home. You know, I wish I could help. He's talking about the kind of discussion that ministers do when they have to make difficult decisions. The ministers that I've had the privilege to know, Dr. Meredith and Mr. Weston, in terms of those God has asked and ordained to help run the church. They, uh, they practice getting counsel as if it were a part of their DNA. He's talking about doing things authoritatively, binding things on earth. If this meant just any two Christians, like, oh yeah, well, we get together for, for dinner and we read the Bible together and then we bind things for the body of Christ. You know, it's happened. I could see uh, other Christians getting together in a different part of the city, having a little Bible study over dinner and binding something completely different for the body of Christ. That's a misapplication of these scriptures. When it says go to the church, it means go to those who have responsibility for the church because there may be a decision here that will impact the entirety of the body of Christ and this person's life. As it continues, actually, in verse 17, in the middle, it says, if he refuses to hear the church, then let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Now, before we get to the last point, I want to wrap this one up by highlighting if we ever go that Matthew 18 route, if we ever go to our brother, we don't have to think of this as an irreversible process. As if the first time we get together with them, this is it. Once, man, it's either me or him out of the church or something, you know, I mean, we don't have to do that. We can go to our brother, we can talk with them. Let's say it doesn't go well. Let's say our brother just says, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't understand why you think that. Uh, I think my email was perfectly fine. It's the, literally the most polite email I've ever written. Uh, I know these words sound disrespectful, but I said them to my mother this morning. So I'm sorry, uh, you're completely wrong. I guess I do call my mother a rat bag every, year, every morning. Uh, so I'm sorry you're offended. Okay, fine. It didn't go well going to my brother. Does that mean, are you, okay, well, next I got to get two more people. I've, I've started Matthew 18. Let me encourage you to think, no, you don't have to do that we can go back and try some of the other things again. Maybe we can overlook it. Maybe we actually can forgive each of these steps because this is a serious process. Every step can be an opportunity to reevaluate. Is this something that truly needs to go forward? We have other tools. And if we're doing Matthew 18, Let's keep those tools in mind. And maybe some of these things are an opportunity to reevaluate. And finally, I'm going to say this at, at, at the end as a last point, but I try to wonder, well, I really should have said this first. But at the same time, I gave myself permission because if you look at uh, the uh, seven laws of success, the last one is the one that in a sense should be first, right? That we have to seek God, that it's, it's God's desire for us and God's plan and his will that we should be seeking. And it's what affects all the others. The last thing that I want to say in terms of a tool is prayer. Pray about it. How many of us actually take our offenses to God and ask him to arrange our thoughts rightly in this regard. In fact, we'll turn to one more scripture before we wrap up. Proverbs chapter 25. This is quoted by Paul in Romans 12, but Proverbs 25 and verse 21. Proverbs 5 and verse 21. 
We're told here, if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For so you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the eternal will reward you. Now, let me highlight, when we're offended, sometimes verse 22 sounds great. Ooh, heaping coals of fire. You know, I, I can't wait to do that. But the way to do that is to be really nice to them and to see to their needs. And, and this, this will be a, a true confession moment, but far earlier, I remember when uh, the Global Church of God, when we began attending the Global Church of God, my family and I, I remember seeing someone, not a local congregation, we were in a different area, but it was someone that I had really been offended by in the past. I was, I was relatively young when this happened. And it was, I felt it was a righteous offense at the time. It was the way they were, they were uh, I would say, misleading some young people about the Sabbath and some other things. I won't go into details. But I remember just really being bothered at the time. But I, I wasn't around the person a whole lot. But then I saw them show up at the Global Church of God and services. They were married by then, had children. And I couldn't believe how much stirred up in me all of a sudden. Like every resentment, every ugly thing I had thought about that person was alive in my mind as if the things they had done had just happened that morning. And I remember just dealing with that and having a hard time dealing with that. And then I remembered some advice that had been given in a sermon. I wish I could think of the sermon. But I will say, I will encourage you to read, say, uh, Mr. Weston's article, Love Thy Neighbor, that he wrote in 2018 about the kind of attitude we should have. It's in the November, December 2018 Living Church News. This desire to think better of others and love our neighbors by our actions and choices. And at that time, that, that article didn't exist, but I did remember hearing something in a sermon about praying for good things for people that have offended you. And not praying, God, please bless this person by helping them overcome their idiocy and their moronic qualities and their hateful, terrible, satanic disposition. Not that, not that, but literally praying for the kind of day that they will have, knowing they've got a job too. You know, please bless them in their job and with their responsibilities. It's difficult bearing some burdens. It's difficult for me on my job. Please bless so-and-so in his job. He's married and has children. Please, please help him with the struggles of being a good father and the struggles of being a good husband and pr really praying for that person as if I actually truly loved that person and not letting the other things slip in, not letting, and please help me forgive him for being a dirtbag. No, wait, you know, that's not it. That's not what I was encouraged by the ministry to do. And I will say, eh, okay, let me say two things. One, I can't say I've always done this. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a kind of love that God is expecting of us, but doesn't come natural. And so I, I will confess, I don't, this doesn't always come to me as quickly as it should. Sometimes I have to rediscover it. But I will say, and I wish I was only one time, but it's been several times, when I have done this, I am grateful for what it has done for my attitude. And I'm grateful how the practice of doing it over several days has realigned my thoughts concerning that person and how my spiritual muscles have been increased to bear with something offensive. Well, Proverbs 25, 21 is good advice. We won't turn there for the sake of time. We need to wrap up and, and my time is up. But as we conclude, let me just highlight, many of you are likely familiar with John chapter 13 and the statement there in verses 34 and 35 where Jesus Christ says that one of the signs that people will see that let them know that we are his disciples is that we love one another. Well, if Jesus Christ's words are true, this has to be some special kind of love, right? Because I know a lot of people in the world that love each other and they're not Christ's disciples. I know people that are selfless towards other people and they're not Christ's disciples. I know people that go through great pain for the sake of other people and they are not Christ's disciples. If love for one another is truly a sign to other people that this is the body of Jesus Christ, these are those who have been forgiven and embraced by the eternal that he will lift 
into the kingdom of God to be with him for all time on a whole other plane of existence. If these are those people, then the love we have to exhibit has to be supernatural. It has to be something that people don't recognize other places. It has to be something that is Christ's own love. And when we have been given an offense, whether from a friend, brother, sister, family member, coworker, minister, when we've been given an offense, the eyes of heaven turn to us because that is when the rubber meets the road. When we show God whether we are capable of the kind of love that truly can be assigned to others that Christ is present in our lives. May all of us pass that test.